morning sir morning hi okay uh, good morning good evening uh, good day in general so thank you dhananjay for inviting me to talk about fwi and as dhananjay just pointed out you know i have been teaching a uh, two day 16 hour short course on fwi and even that does not appear sufficient to give all the details of FWI. So in this 45 minutes or an hour or so presentation, I will uh, basically hit upon the fundamentals and try to give you some ideas on the basic uh, concepts so that you can uh, further dig into this particular subject. And obviously being a concise uh, talk, There'll be some missions, so feel free to send me an email later on or for any further, uh, any further help that you might need. So this would be my general uh, uh, sort of uh, content or plan for presentation. We'll try to uh, set the motivation for why, we, uh, why, why we're interested in, uh, in FWI. And there are some uh, basic uh, ideas are basic methodologies that you must be familiar with. And those include forward modeling optimization and some details of uh, FWI, rather some of the particular uh, items in optimization that are specific to FWI. And I will um, try to talk about those. And then in particular, please pay attention to what are the problems with FWI because as a user, you must be uh, familiar with it, what can be uh, what can be a, a particular problem running an FWI so that you can tell facts from artifacts. And I will very briefly show one example. Like I said, I'm not going to be able to cover all the details, so I'll just pick one example. So I like to start with data because uh, that's what uh, we have to deal with. So this is an this is a synthetic model. And most of you are familiar with this. This is, uh, this is a standard salt model from SVG. And if I were to uh, put a shot here and look at all the, all the receivers along the surface, you can see a gather that looks like this. All right, so now uh, in exploration seismology, standard seismic processing that we have been doing for uh, like three or four decades, would focus on mostly these uh, so-called uh, called, you know, hyperbolic events, these are reflections. And anything uh, looks like looking like this would generally be muted out before seismic processing. Now it turns out, and this has been recognized by academic community a long time ago, that there's a lot of useful information in, any, in lots of these things. And we will, uh, we will be uh, talking about those as to what they are and how they can be useful in, 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 in knowing what's going on in the subsurface. So the, uh, the takeaway uh, take message from this is that this is a subsurface model, which is unknown. We really don't know uh, what this looks like, but we are given gathers like this. This is just an example of one shot gather. And we, we can place this shot anywhere along the surface, and then we can collect all of these data sets. And then we are supposed to back out information on the subsurface, which looks like this. And this could be different in different places in the world. And uh, so uh, how, how do we actually get to this? And that is basically uh, done by, by propagating seismic waves through the model. So you can actually see the wave front propagating. It's a, basically a different time steps. You can see these reflected, refracted, diffracted waves. All of these are propagating through the entire medium. And this is what we get to collect on the surface, okay? Now, uh, from all of these records, we're supposed to build a subsurface model the velocity, reflectivity, lithology, and so on and so forth. There's one particular uh, property, rock property, or, or one particular factor that is the most important, that is seismic wave velocity. And over the years, uh, we have used different techniques for estimating seismic wave velocities. 
starting with uh, with NML, stacking velocity, and uh, this is something that you have to do. That's the very first step in seismic processing. And this is pretty much now a more of a conveyor belt kind of operation. You run all the CDP gathers to a program, and then you look at those uh, those coherence plots, and then based on that, you pick velocities. And those velocities are very, very approximate, and you can even argue that this is not a real velocity. Then the next step was to go after a little bit after amplitude, which was done is looking at amplitude variation in angle. And this makes locally 1D approximation. And then almost in parallel, uh, in earthquake seismology and global seismology community, we've been doing seismic tomography. And uh, that basically works with a particular attribute, which is basically travel time. And now we're at a stage where he's using full seismic gathers, like the ones I showed you. And that is called full wave form inversion. So uh, what do we get from, uh, from different uh, uh, kinds of approaches? Now this is one picture uh, that was put together by John Clebo. So it basically shows you how, uh, how much information is contained uh, by different wave number uh, uh, that is that is recovered by by different data sets. So this is a velocity and this is a function of wave number. So you can see that uh, uh, this is very low power, low frequency part, and this perhaps uh, comes from uh, some of it comes from from NMO, but then there is also a part that is that is missing, which is not recorded in the data. I'll, I'll touch upon that a little bit more. Then tomography uh, can fill up a little bit of this, this low frequency part. Reflectivity can, uh, a review kind of uh, approach can, can give us some information on the band in which, in the seismic frequency band. So there is a, always an increasing uh, effort being put into in filling in the gap in seismic velocity information. Uh, so uh, here, our goal is that someday FWI would be able to fill up the entire, entire, entire velocity gap that we have. I don't think we have reached there yet, but we're getting close. So uh, before we uh, talk about FWI, the, the very first thing that you need to understand is seismology or what is the information contained in a short gather. Whenever you try to analyze some data, you always have some model in your mind. So given this particular chart gather, uh, if you uh, are not trained in, in wave propagation and just know basic seismic processing, then you can, you can identify these yellow highlighted events and you can, so these are my, my reflections. But then what are these and what is this? Okay, so these are different phases, and they also contain some 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 useful information. So let's look at these in in somewhat detail. So here uh, we have different models. So we can start to build our model with simple model. Say for example, I have a, a simple layer over a half space model. What it means is that I have a, I have a, I have only one reflector. Okay. Now this is the model that we have been using for years with, with, with a bunch of flat lying layers. But uh, we know that there is a continuous change in velocity. So this is a discontinuous change in velocity, but this is a, there can be a continuous change in velocity and particularly in sediments, you know, due to compaction, you can see gradual change, change in velocity with depth. There can be a combination of a homogeneous layer and a gradient. The homogeneous and the gradient layer can be separated by a discontinuity. This can also be a two homogeneous layer separated by a continuous change in velocity. In fact, this is the most realistic thing. And in reality, uh, you may not have a have a real discontinuity in velocity, but in some frequency band that we are interested in, a continuous change in velocity between the interfaces may appear like a discontinuity. 
And then there are some other combinations here. So if I draw uh, first ray diagrams, again, seismology 101, I don't know how many, we call it 101, which is the basic course. So here you have a source and you have one interface. So these are the waves you can expect. There's a direct wave, there's a reflected wave, and this is, these are reflections with increasing angles. And we know that when uh, your reflection angle reaches critical, we have something called the head wave, which propagates along the interface and then comes back up here. Now the theory of head waves is actually quite interesting. And uh, if you really want to go into details of that, because when I was told about head waves, it just didn't make sense to me. How can weight be generated like this? And this head wave does not propagate into the lower medium. Of course, here, your, your V1 is greater than V0. Okay, so this is an increase in velocity. If there was a decrease in velocity, then there is no critical angle and there is no, no direct wave and no, no head waves. So uh, again, uh, this is beyond the scope of this talk to, uh, to, to give you details of how head waves are generated. But if you're interested, you can look up uh, in chapter four of Aki and Richard's book. All right, so let's look at the seismogram corresponding to this model. Here I have the direct wave, I have the reflected wave, and then you can see the head wave. So head wave propagates with the velocity of the lower medium, which is, so this one has this velocity of V1. But there are some problems so with, uh, I mean, this is theoretically very nice and you see very clear head waves when you do a lab experiment with plexiglass. Uh, even theory predicts that the head wave amplitudes are very, very small and they decay very fast and there is also a phase change. So if you have a delta function as a source, your head wave might look like a, it looks like a step function. So uh, this are, you can sort of see this, but they are very difficult to, to follow uh, all the way through all offsets. Now, if you look at a uh, uh, layer overlying a gradient zone, then that forms diving rays. Now, this is where the interesting things start to happen. If you see, these are the multiply turning diving rays. They get reflected at the bottom of this, 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 this interface uh, of the top layer. And now this is, this is, uh, this is a seismogram. This is, this, is, this is a seismic record that has the direct wave and this has the reflection and this has both head wave and, 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 the, and the turning rays. So, when I combine this two, and I uh, trace the travel time, what you see here is that your diving waves and the multiply reflected diving waves and the head waves, they are so close together. And it turns out that, they, that the multiply reflecting diving waves have, have much stronger amplitudes. So now you are able to see those very clearly. Uh, at, at, at large offsets, you can actually see that. So head wave amplitudes are kind of enhanced by, by combining it with the, with, the, with the diving wave. So that way we can use these together and that will help us build the velocity model. Couple of points to note here. If you were into conventional seismic processing that I learned or which I started with when I started my career, we would have needed this. Not so tough, uh, not so so sharp. Maybe here, then I'll be losing all of that stuff. Okay, and there too, that that is one thing. Second thing is that recording was mostly limited to short offsets a year. Okay, but not not anymore. So here I'm showing you what kind of information you can get from from different. Uh, different uh, parts of seismic data. So here we have, uh, as you can see, I'm showing you seismic tomography. So here with, there are some red dots. So we have picked some first arriving phases and this was the starting velocity model and this is the final velocity model. This not only came from, uh, from, the, from those, those, those early arriving phases, but also with some, some constraint and that gave, gives rise to the basic kind of structure that you have. Now this model that gets fed into, into what is called full 
waveform inversion, which takes the entire gather and uh, takes the entire gather and then uh, models everything, not just the travel time, amplitude, phase, all kinds of stuff, using this as a starting model. And then, then it updates all the velocity model and you get uh, lots of details that you don't see here. And now you can use that velocity model to say to do reverse time migration. And this is an example of, of a velocity model superimposed on the, on the RTM image. I have not told you how this is done. So that's one, that is the thing that I'm gonna focus on next. Another uh, a nice example is, uh, is the paper by Pratt where he showed that from a crosswell experiment, when you have two crosswells and then you have the logs, and this is basically interpolation and interpretation of the logs. And this shows you, this is the carbonate layer. And you know, then, then this, is a, this is a geologist's interpretation of a fault. Now taking uh, the VSP data, crosswell data from here, running uh, inversion, this is the kind of image you get. If you just did the, did the travel time tomography, you get a velocity model that looks like this. But when you, uh, when you uh, put in the full waveform data, the picture changes completely. So what you see here is, uh, is the detail, a lot of details in here, and that clearly shows you uh, the faults. Here, there is a hint of the, of the fault, and that there are some faults in there, but I don't think uh, you can pick with, uh, with high degree of certainty as to where the fault planes are. So this is uh, these are the these are the reasons for for uh, delving into into FWI because we expect to get more and more information. So here I wanted to uh, summarize uh, these three different approaches uh, using different uh, uh, different data parts. So here in the first column I have the method, second column uh, and then the second row, uh, in the first row I have the method, second row I have the data that we use in the forward modeling operator and, and then some kind something called optimization, which I will talk about a little later. So, uh, you know, when we uh, use only amplitude information from minimal character gather, we use reflection coefficient equations, either a Zopritz equation or some uh, linearized version of it. And then we iteratively uh, fit the amplitude and uh, amplitude as a function of angle to update, say, velocity or any other, say, density or so on and so forth. Now, when we do this uh, with peak travel times, uh, then we use ray tracing, and this is based on iconal equations. And then, uh, again, we do some kind of optimization to come up with a fit to the travel time, and that gives us velocity information. And remember the, the picture uh, that I showed you earlier from John Clairbo's diagram, and that can basically, you can now think about how these informations fit into that particular, particular diagram. Now, FWI uses short gathers, no NMO. It uses wave equation to, uh, to compute synthetics, and then, uh, uh, then it fits the data, the full gathers, iteratively to come up with a bit of the velocity model and hopefully uh, you get higher and higher frequencies. So if you go from right to left, all of these are based on wave equations. This uses the full wave equation. This uses a very high frequency approximation, just called an asymptotic approximation of the wave equation. And this uses flat lying plane layer approximation and focuses only on reflection coefficients. So you can see the kind of approximation uh, that is used, but just wanted to tell you, just because you're using wave equation does not mean we're representing the, the realistic, always realistic wave propagation because we use some approximations. All right. If you look at technological developments, uh, for many years, uh, we did time imaging then we uh, moved into depth imaging. So when you use time imaging, we're using mostly uh, RMS velocities, right? Now in depth imaging, we use interval velocities. 
And depth imaging initially was focused or concentrated mostly using, uh, using asymptotic methods. But then came reverse time migration, which uses basically full wave equation. And we needed uh, more details in the velocity model. And here I talked about least squares migration and FWI, uh, but actually least squares migration, if I remember correctly, was invented later than, than the theory of FWI. The theory of FWI was, was developed in the, in the late 70s or early 80s, and least squares migration came a little bit later, but, but uh, I like to put it in this sequence because that is the best way to, to describe this. Because least squares migration uh, essentially uh, improves on reverse time migration or any other kind of migration. The least squares RTM improves on reverse time migration. Improving means it tries to get better images of reflectivity without perturbing the velocity. FWI goes after velocities, everything together. So, and then that, and the, and the optimization technique and other things are, have close, close similarities with, with the least squares migration. Now, uh, all of these require velocity model of some kind. And if, if you go from top to bottom, you are putting in complexities in the velocity model. And how do we actually do that? For that, you have to understand two things. Like, not just two things, but two basic things. One is wave equation, another is seismic wave simulation. Again, seismology 101. So uh, to describe uh, wave propagation, there are two equations that are fundamental. One is the equation of motion, another is the Hooke's law. And this is just a fancy way of writing Hooke's law to confuse people, but uh, mm, this basically means uh, stress is proportional to strain, and this is Newton's law of motion. Now, uh, if you plug in the relation for stress in the, in, the, in the equation of motion, this is basically balance of momentum, what you get is the wave equation. Now this wave equation that I wrote here is uh, one for inhomogeneous and isotropic media. Our goal is someday to be able to do this, but uh, we right now we are, we are we're settling for something which is not that sophisticated or which is not, which is an approximation of that. So the level of uh, approximations that go in here is isotropic. And uh, here, all you do is plug in the elastic coefficients for the isotropic medium. And here you can, you can sort of identify the P wave and the S wave and so on and so forth. Even that is not commonly used in FWI yet. What we use is a is a even is even a even a simpler version of it, which is the acoustic wave equation, and that to constant density, and that is given by this equation. Where p is some scalar, typically it can be pressure wave field, and p is the velocity which is varying in all x, y, and z directions. And this is the Laplacian. Uh, so this is the as you know what you know what del square is, and f is the force term. The point to be noted here is that. Given this equation, we are having to deal with only one field variable, that is pressure, okay? If you want to deal with elastic waves correctly, you need to deal with three component plus maybe uh, in case of marine experiment, uh, four components, and three components of displacements and one, one, one pressure. But here, let, let, just for simplicity, uh, we focus on acoustic wave equation where we have only one pressure, one variable pressure, and there is one parameter, but that parameter varies everywhere. So we have a large number of, of, of grids in three dimensions that we have to solve for so solve velocities for. Okay, so how do we uh, solve our wave equation? The most popular method is finite difference, and I'm not gonna talk about finite element, and some other variants, just, just uh, in a simple form. All you do is you take these derivatives and write those in, uh, in the Taylor series expansion. And this is the approximation that we have. 
for the second derivative of uh, time, as a second derivative of uh, p with respect to time. This is with respect to x coordinate and with respect to y coordinate. So inherent in this is discretization of the medium. So you take the medium and then you discretize. So when you're talking about uh, forward modeling, we assume that we know the velocities, okay? So here uh, is a 2D, uh, 2D grid, a 2D mesh. So these are the nodes. See if I represent X nodes along the X by I, and this is J. Let's say that I want to compute a derivative at some point I J. So to compute the second derivative with respect to, uh, to, to X, I need these three points, okay? To compute y derivative, I need these three points, okay? So that's my finite difference stencil and it moves and then you capture the wave field. So you initiate your wave field by injecting a source at some source location and then you rearrange this term so that on the left-hand side, you compute pressure wave field at a future time, given the current time, the past time, and the spatial derivative of the, of, the, of the pressure. So you need to compute spatial derivatives to be able to compute your time derivatives. And this is the standard formula and you can just write a program in your sleep and you can actually see how the movies are generated. Okay, so this kind of approach is called, called an explicit time marching approach. Now this is only fourth, second order finite difference you can go to higher order finite differences and which will improve, improve accuracy. So ideally, I mean, I mean, basically what you do is you take the model and then you grid the model. You can place your source anywhere in the medium. And since the wave field is propagated everywhere in the medium, so you can capture the wave field anywhere in the numerical environment, but in field you cannot capture capture wave field everywhere. It's only restricted to perhaps in the surface or maybe a couple of boreholes. One other thing that uh, we have to be uh, careful about is when you are discretizing your, your model and you are restricting your model to certain X min, X max, Y min, Y max, the waves tend to bounce back, okay? Which is unreal, which is not realistic. So you have to put some kind of bond absorption absorbing like a damping. So you have to keep some space around the model to be able to damp the wave so that it does not come and contaminates your useful information that you're interested in, okay? Uh, please feel free to interrupt. Uh, and if you have any question, you know, I can answer on the way or we can wait till the end, doesn't matter. Okay, I should have told you this earlier. All right, so you could also, alternately, you could also solve the wave equation in frequency domain. Although I'll not go into details of the of frequency domain approach, but it's worthwhile to just mention that you take this uh, uh, time domain wave equation, which I showed you earlier. So in time domain approach, you discretize this form by finite difference. In frequency domain, we, what we do first is do a Fourier transform. And once we do the Fourier transform, this basically, the left-hand side changes to omega squared by b squared, but this p tilde is the frequency domain uh, uh, version of, of, of p. So still we have, uh, we have the spatial derivatives, and this we can discretize using finite differences. And this k here is our wave number, which is omega over v. Now, one other thing that you could do here as a part of simulation is to impose boundary conditions. And if you are interested in just imposing one wave, wave equation, which looks like this, you discretize it and put the whole system uh, in, a, in a systematic way. And that gives us a linear system of equation. So this is the unknown, which is the wave field or pressure that we're trying to solve for. And this term contains all other information. And uh, so essentially what you we're supposed to do is to solve this linear system for you. 
So this is a sparse and square matrix. It's complex because we're doing in, in frequency domain and uh, we're propagating, uh, all, all the quantities are complex now. This is non-symmetric and it's indefinite. That means this can have both positive and negative eigenvalues. And this kind of system is not that easy to solve in 2D. It's, it's actually you know, fairly simple, but in 3D it becomes pretty time consuming. So that's why it's still not popular. Although frequency domain has a lot of advantages. And you can solve this system using uh, something called uh, called LED decomposition. And now we have some uh, some iterative solvers uh, which can run quite fast, and then also a parallelized version of it. Now, uh, so having talked about uh, about modeling, uh, let's mention briefly what RTM is. So here is an example. Uh, from a published paper. So on the left-hand side, I have an image of some data set that has been created using uh, say Kirchhoff migration, which is a symptotic theory based or lay theory based. And on the right-hand side, I have image of the same data, but computed with full wave uh, equation migration. And this is called uh, and this is reverse time migration. So you can see huge difference between, between these two. So this should be uh, enough to, to, uh, to convince yourself that it's really worthwhile to get into more, uh, bringing in more complete physics. So you can see this part of the salt and you can see how the sediments are, uh, are butting against this. And you can, you can also look at the differences. And also, you know, at depth, you can see a lot more clarity in the image. Okay, uh, so uh, what, do we, uh, what do we do in RTM? We forward propagate our source wave field, we backward propagate our data, then we cross correlate to obtain an image. And I want you to remember this because I'm gonna be talking, I'm gonna be showing this to you in the context of, uh, in the context of, uh, uh, of FWI. Now, wave field propagation uh, in the heterogeneous media, in heterogeneous media is computationally very expensive, and that I will very briefly talk about in a second. Now, in least squares migration, what is done is, again, right now I'm just telling you what is done without going into the mechanics of it, uh, getting into details of the mechanics. So, First, you take the input data, you do an RTM, so you get a reflectivity image. So you take the image and do some kind of a born modeling to generate synthetic data. You compare the input data, you get the residual, and then you RTM again, and then you update your reflectivity image, again do the modeling, and then. So here, your model parameters are reflectivity, okay? The velocity is, is fixed. We don't change the velocity. Okay. Now this is, now finally I'm coming to, uh, to FWI description. So what do we do in FWI? Let's say that this is my true model, which is known only to God, if anybody wants to believe in God, we don't know what the true model looks like. We've collected data over it. And this is, this is my observed data, a short gather. And what we do is, since I don't know what the model looks like, I look at my, I look at my ancillary information, like, you know, if there's any well around there, if any work has been done in that area, I've done some, some preliminary processing of the data, NMO, and come up with a very rough velocity model, okay? Which is my starting model. And then I use the computer to generate some synthetic data. I look at the difference between these two. Obviously, it's not going to match because this model is very different from what's actually going on inside the Earth. So there is some, some residual. And then what I do is I, I use this residual to update my velocity model. Now think about this when you're actually picking NMO velocities, okay? I say that you have, you have a gather, 
and then you applied NMO with certain velocity. So it can, be, it can so happen that your gather became like this, or it can so happen that your gather becomes like this. What you want is, is, flat, is to be flat. So looking at, looking at these, this under correction or over correction, or looking at the residual, you can then decide how much you want to change your velocity so that it comes to being flattened. But this is exactly what we're doing, except that we're doing for the whole gather at a time, or at one time, all the gathers at a time. So and this is not being done manually. Computer does it for you using a mathematical tool called optimization. So it takes this information, computes an update, and then adds that update to this velocity model, goes in there, recomputes the forward model, again gets the residual and repeats it until there is an acceptable fit between the observed data and synthetic data, in which case you can say that, aha, we got the velocity model. Okay, so here is my, my residual, observed data and synthetic data, the calculated data. And we calculate from here something called the gradient, which is essentially in the derivative of uh, this, this function. And this function is called cost function or objective function, take the derivative. And that derivative is what is used in updating the model in a method called, called steepest descent. Which is not the best method, but I will just focus on that for now, just to, to, to explain the concepts. So uh, here is a, is a better flow diagram. I have my model M, which is velocity. I run the forward modeling. This is my, my acoustic wave equation. I generated my data prediction. Then I take my observed data. I look at the difference between the two and I minimize this objective function. And the way I minimize it is by computing a perturbation uh, to the velocity, which is given by this equation, and then I iterate over it. And I, uh, I stop when my, my value of the error function does not change anymore or when the error starts to increase, okay? And this is a deterministic approach where we're always, where we're always trying to improve upon our velocity model, okay? So uh, in a cartoon, this is what is done for, it's displayed for one parameter. Let's see that this is your, your objective function and I want to find this minimum. So I can start from here. I compute the gradient and then I go in the opposite direction of the gradient because that's where the, that is the direction in which your cost function is decreasing and I take multiple steps, okay? And this is basically very complex. Uh, it is very complicated when you have thousands of parameters, which is which is the case. But this kind of uh, this kind of uh, uh, demonstrate the basic idea. So one important thing is how do we compute the gradient of the cost function? I showed you how to how to compute e, which is the uh, or f, whatever you want to call it, uh, the objective function. The objective function requires solving a wave equation. Now, solving a wave equation is computationally quite expensive uh, with, with numerical methods, but you know, with parallel computers, supercomputer, we're able to do it pretty quickly nowadays. And 2D is pretty simple to do nowadays, even on desktops. Uh, how do you compute gradient? And that's a, that's a, that's a very difficult, uh, proposition because uh, computing gradient using finite differences would be impossible if you have a large number of parameters. So it turns out that there is an easier approach, uh, which is called a joint state approach. And I will simply just touch upon the theory and more focus more on how it's done. So here I have my constant density acoustic wave equation, which gives us the synthetic data. And I have, I have my observed data here so I can write my cost function as the difference between observed data and synthetic data, or you can just sum over all X's and LLTs, and you can discretize it and you can replace the integral with the sum. 
Now, this idea came from uh, uh, from optimal control theory, in the, uh, where basically this was first uh, uh, formulated, and 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 uh, Tarantula and uh, a couple of other uh, French scientists actually showed how to use that for computing gradient. So uh, here. Given this cost function, what we do is that we uh, we say that I this is called this is an augmented uh, cost function L. We say that minimize my error or minimize the residual with the constraint that we satisfy the wave equation. Okay, and this lambda is called the Lagrange multiplier or that joint variable. And then all you have to do is to now set del L, del M is equal to zero. And taking the derivative of L when we have integrals and things like that is, uh, is not, uh, not straightforward. Uh, we just set the first variation with respect to P sin equal to zero and we integrate by parts. So it involves a little bit of algebra. It's not, uh, it's not extremely difficult. You can teach yourself. I will not go through this, but I will, I will show you is that once you go through uh, the few lines of algebra, what you see is that we get a differential equation for our adjoint variable lambda, okay? Now this adjoint variable solves essentially the wave equation. This is the same as the wave equation. The difference is that the field that we are competing is lambda and the right-hand side, rather than the source function, I have the data residual. So first you generate a short gather, look at the residual, and you feed it as an as initial condition, but you feed it backward in time. And that comes out from the, from the condition that we need to, to set some of the integrals going to zero. And that means that in, in forward calculation, we're computing the wave field, but for adjoint calculation, we are propagating the residual backward in time. And it turns out that you can compute the gradient simply by cross correlating your observed or the forward propagating wave field with the adjoint wave field. That plus uh, some extra terms here. So there are three steps here. One is uh, forward propagating the wave field, which you are already doing for computing the, the, the synthetic seismogram. Once you're done with that, then you have the residual between the observed and the, and the synthetic data, which you back propagate it using the same wave equation. And then you do cross correlation. So what is the advantage of taking such a complicated path as it appears? The advantage is that you can compute this adjoint variable at the same cost as solving your one forward calculation. And the cross correlation really doesn't cost that much. So what it means is that the equivalent of one forward modeling, you can compute the gradient. So one plus one, so two. Well, it's actually a bit more, uh, it's not as simple as it sounds because you have to be able to save all the wave fields and it causes a nightmare in terms of memory management, which is beyond the scope of this talk. But, but the technique is, is, is pretty simple and it actually works reasonably, it is really well. So here I'm showing you how, how this works. So here you have the source wave field that you're generating. Let's say that you have a reflector here. So for the initial times, the source and receiver wave field, they're not time coincident, so you don't see anything when you cross correlate, it's all zero. But as you approach the reflector, then you can see that they, they correlate and they generate and they generate some kind of a, a, they generate significant gradient information at the reflector. This is for a single source and single receiver. So when you have a whole bunch of these, then you can start to build the gradient information at different parts and then use that to update your model. Now remember that, yeah, this looks pretty good, but it requires that you have to have a fairly good idea what the velocity is. If the velocity is wrong, then you'll be actually competing this, the, this which, is, which is not quite the same. But what we do here is that we start with the velocity and then we, we, we compute the gradient, apply the update, part of the update, and then keep on improving iteratively. So let's look very quickly at the 
at the contributions of different phases. Uh, you just saw the diagram that I showed you for the, for the gradient. So that is also information that tells you about where is, which part of the model is affecting which part of, this, of the seismic area, okay? So you have, a, you have a source wave field, you have a receiver wave field, and from a single scattering information, you can generate a picture that looks like this. Now, this is, this is, a, this is a very useful figure to remember. And this is the simplest that I could find. So this is a, a picture in the wave number domain. This is Kx and Ky. And here we have four pi by lambda, I mean four pi by lambda max, and this is the negative wave numbers. So what you see is that these lambda max and lambda mean are affected by, by these are the, these are the wavelengths, and these are affected by the frequency content in the in the data. These are also affected by the velocity. And so this depends on frequency, depends on velocity, and it depends on offset. Okay. So one thing you see is that this is a typical uh, coverage. So this part, which is with the, with the dark dots, is the is the early number domain in the model that is covered, given some um, f mean and f max. One thing that you notice here is that there's a part in the low wave number that is that is missing. So this, you can push it to go to that part. If there are two ways, if you have large offsets, very large offset or, and or, not I shouldn't say or, and you also boost your low frequencies by, by your experimental design. So can we have a source that can go to very low frequency? And there is a lot of research going on in the industry on, on low frequency sources so that we can fill in that, that low frequency gap. On the, on the higher side, you know, basically, uh, also uh, other thing that's important is that um, the diving waves, you know, they, they now come in very nicely into, into contributing to, to filling in that gap, but still they may not be sufficient unless we have very, very low frequency component. Now this kind of diagram, this is a very simple 1D scattering approximation but uh, this is sort of uh, gives you a fairly good idea as to what to expect when you have some data set and which part of the model is contributing to what. That part I have, not, I have kind of skipped. So what are the problems with FWI? One is computational cost and another is called, called cycle skipping. So what is that? Well, where is, where is the computation? Here we have uh, observed data and synthetic data with some of our all shots and all receivers, okay? And of course, forward modeling is expensive. So misfit function and G is a nonlinear forward modeling operator for computing this. So, uh, oops, going backward, what? Okay, so here, uh, the, the total cost would be the number of iterations times cost per iterations, okay? Now, when you uh, do the FWI update calculation, you have to choose after computing the gradient, what is the weight or what we call step length. And for that, we need to, we need to do a couple, at least three forward calculations. So this is for, for, for the staple calculation, and this is for adjoint calculation and for short gather calculation. So you can see that uh, for each shot, uh, for each iteration, we are at least competing two plus three, five, okay? For one, there at the least, there can be more. And then there is this cost about, uh, about managing uh, your, your oh, snapshots. Okay, so what are the things people have done? All right, one uh, simple idea would be, we know that each time I run a forward modeling operation, it's expensive, so it's linear in the number of shots. More the shots, more is the ex expense for competing. <clears throat> what if I simulate all the shots simultaneously? Is that gonna work? Well, if you just do direct summation, <coughs> what you see is there is some, some kind of crosstalks. 
from different charts. So that's really not a very good idea. But it turns out that if you sum the shots with some kind of a, some kind of phase shift or some kind of phase encoding, and even yet better, if that phase encoding is is random. If we did that, then then uh, you can actually uh, you can you can save a lot in computational cost. And Exxon Mobil and uh, also uh, Western GCO has uh, has some papers on that that you might want to look into. So I just picked this particular example for <coughs> at RTM, which is this is migration, which is uh, you know basically the same for when you apply it to, to FWI. So this is the original migrated image of, Mar of our Marbusi model with all the shots. And this is with, with random phase encoding, and this is the difference. So this cost is a lot less than, 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 than migrating all the shots. And you can see that the differences are, are there are differences, but it's not, not tremendous. So this is, this is one way uh, you can approach uh, one way uh, you can try to try to reduce the computational cost. Uh, you could also uh, do what is known as uh, plane wave uh, phase encoding, which is essentially transforming the data with a linear phase shift, which is which is the Taupe transform, and that also helps. And there are uh, there are some papers on that. And in three D, this becomes problematic because. <laughs> Doing a 3D transformation when you have Y coverage is not dense, you can have, have you can have some artifacts. So this is one other idea. Okay, so the next point is, is cycle skipping. All right. So let's say that uh, as I told you, we're trying to match our observed data with synthetic data. So let's say that I have uh, this red uh, trace, which is uh, which is my target. And we have many of these, remember, I'm just showing you two. And here I'm competing a synthetic trace by blue. And for different velocity model, it appears in different places, right? On the, on the time axis. You can see that as we move from left to right and I compute the, the error function, which is shown here below, you can see that it goes from a minimum here when it actually matched only one peak, but then it actually finds the, the best, uh, uh, the lowest error when it matches both the, both the arrivals. But then again, when it is close to which it matches this one, second one, then it has another, another, uh, another uh, trough. So these local troughs, these are called local minimum, and this is called a global minimum. And of course, from, from this particular picture, it's quite obvious that uh, to be able to get the best model, you have to be close to this, not to this or this. And this is called cycle skipping. This problem called cycle skipping, and this is the local minimum issue. So you have to be close to, to this and within, within half a wavelength uh, to be able to uh, push it towards, uh, uh, towards the global minimum solution. And, uh, there's quite a bit of research that has gone into, into, into addressing this. So the, you can see the effect of, of, of local minimum here. The Marmusi model, this is the initial model. And if you use this as an initial model, you get a pretty good solution, which actually looks almost like the, like the true model. However, if you use a very uh, highly smooth uh, initial model, which is shown here, and run an FWI, you get a suboptimal solution, which looks like this. And this, this picture should, should be convincing enough uh, to you that you need to be uh, somewhat close to, to the exact model, okay? Which is unknown. So what we do is we basically do a lot of trial and error and start with different velocity models until we get something that looks reasonable. There are uh, ways to addressing this. One would be multi-scale FWI. I won't be able to go into details of all of these methods. And there is one that we worked on, which is, which is a global optimization. Uh, and then uh, there's mini batch stochastic gradient. And it turns out this mini batch uh, stochastic gradient, which I won't, have, I won't go over today, maybe another time. This has got great potential. You know, this not only addresses your, uh, 
your computational cost and memory issue, but also uh, it can do a much better than better job than, than a standard gradient descent when it comes to the problem of cycle skipping. So here is uh, what they look like uh, when you stage over frequency. This is zero to three hertz, this is three to six hertz. Uh, so this, uh, this model at low frequency becomes a starting model for the next batch of higher frequency and so on and so forth. And if you did it in the sequence, then you can see that uh, after, after uh, a few iterations of batches of frequencies, you are able to, able to get a model, which is it's fairly close, okay? So, uh, so staging over frequency is, is now pretty, pretty standard. Uh, it's become pretty standard procedure. Even though uh, we apply our uh, FWI in time domain, uh, we can choose our frequency bands and then, then, then go through this procedure. Uh, so I can show you, uh, this is the true model, this is, a, this is the starting model, and this is the inverted model. This is, this is an old paper, now we are even better than this. So hybrid method is something that uh, the Dimension uh, worked on. So what is done here is uh, we use a global optimization method, but with a sparse parameterization, use that to generate a starting model, and then, then um, uh, then you use a, use a, this is a standard gradient descent optimization. So the way uh, the Manjin did his uh, parameterization is you'd look at the stack section and pick some interfaces and pick some of these, these nodes and represent those as, uh, as splines, but these are, these, are the, these are the tight splines. And uh, so, so the model is represented by a whole bunch of node points and those nodes can be variable in X and Y, and their velocities at those nodes can also be the variable. So this is just to basically get a macro model or, or, a, or a starting model for FWI. So if you look at this, so this thus model uh, from the data, this is how he would put the he would pick these, but these are these are all uh, allowed to vary uh, fairly in a fairly broad range. And then you run the global optimization and you get a model that looks like this. Then you use this model to run FWI on this model on the, on the, on the full gather. And this is what it looks like, which is, which is almost perfect. This is actually a, a fairly good technique and we've seen a lot of people uh, following up on this, this particular approach. In the industry also people are beginning to use this. Um, so, uh, with this, I would like to now uh, touch upon one particular uh, uh, application example. By the way, this is, I just picked it by no means, uh, uh, I have any financial interest in this. This is a published paper in interpretation. There are some very good papers, uh, which I'm not able to show today. There is a paper by, uh, by our own MTAs. Uh, uh, that came out recently. It's a very good paper that you should also look at. I wish I had more time. And also there's a paper by, uh, by Partha and a few others uh, from ExxonMobil on FWI. Uh, but let me show you this one. And once you've seen this, you, you've, I strongly recommend that you look into some other papers. Now, Leading Edge is a, is, a, is a good journal to look at actual applications. And I would strongly encourage you to, to go through some of the special issues on FWI there. So here, the goal was to derive a velocity model from a narrow azimuth survey in the Mexican side of Gulf of Mexico, okay? So this is the area. You can look at it on my slides. All right, so I'll focus on the results here. So you can see this is the ray tomography, just to reiterate on, on some of the uh, approaches that I was talking about. This is simple ray tomography. This is diving ray tomography, where we actually allow for, for diving rays. And now between ray and diving ray, you can see the difference is that you're getting a lot more details compared to this. And this is an, and this is an RTM, and this is diving ray plus, plus reflection FWI, okay? So this goes like this, okay? So ray tomography, diving ray FWI, and diving ray plus reflection FWI. Okay, this is just a tomography. This is the diving ray FWI means you basically focus on the on the diving ray part of the data to, to run FWI. 
So each each time, uh, so this becomes an, a starting model for for this one. Then this becomes a starting model for that one. And now, if you look at the RTM image, it has a lot of details. And there was this well here, and you can see that even they are able to to reproduce a lot of the details of the of the wells to this procedure here. Now. Uh, what I liked about this paper is uh, some of the pictures that they presented, which is quite good for, for teaching purposes. In particular, these are the common channel gathers and they're showing model data. Is that okay? Everything I don't know. All right, so uh, you see different, uh, different uh, uh, different uh, green uh, data, different parts of this. And that shows you what it looks like when you go from tomography to diving ray to FWI or reflection tomography, reflection of FWI. So we are going from the very broad picture to, to some of the shallow details, then to deeper part of the model as, as, as you go from here to here. These are the uh, different, uh, different channel gathers that they have. And you can generate your, your own uh, set of pictures like this when you're doing an FWI. So this tells you uh, how you are building the model. And this also tells you how you are matching different parts of the data, which are contributing to different parts of the model. Just wanted to remind you of that, that, that wave number diagram that I showed you. And this can be directly correlated to, to pictures like this. So here uh, we have depth slices. Uh, so this, the, uh, the A is this is a ray tomography model, and this is the final FWI model, and this is RTM. So RTM was done on, on, on 60 hertz uh, RTM. So the RTM was done to a much higher frequency than, than FWI. And uh, of course, this is uh, this is uh, got all the details of geology, which I don't understand, obviously, because I'm not a not an expert in geological interpretation. And this is another another slice uh, at 4260 meters. These are different depths and, and all these details. It's beautiful. I don't think it would be possible to, to derive images like this uh, if we did not uh, apply FWI. And uh, this, all, this, this is here at the top of the reservoir. And this is amplitude and velocity constructed in the base of the channel. You can see how nicely the, the channels are uh, channels are, are imaged here. And similarly, this is a shallow uh, shallow stacked sand in the inline direction, and, and this is the three D view of the channel. So, after FWI, you can see uh, all the details. Now, remember, we are used to using locally one D AVA kind of inversion to to get to this. Wouldn't it be nice if we actually did FWI? Is that velocity as a starting model in our AVA kind of work? Yes, and that is being done now in the industry. And a lot of people are focusing that. Even in this paper, there is some example of that, which uh, due to lack of time, I did not include because I think I've already gone over an hour. So uh, to summarize, uh, what I was, uh, I hope I was able to convey is, is why is it that you need FWI? These are the questions for you, which I'm not going to answer. I think I've already answered those. Uh, what do you need for FWI? You already know. How does FWI work? What can you learn from FWI results? Something that we didn't learn before, all the details that you see in the result. And on top of that, I, I showed you what the problems are in FWI. Computation cost, uh, cycle skipping, and those things. And application areas. Uh, of course, I showed the example from seismic exploration. Whole Earth community is, is also working on uh, applying to a whole bunch of passive seismic data. GPR, uh, there's a nice paper in science on medical imaging using FWI. Non-destructive testing that the engineers do, they're also beginning to use FWI. And of course, uh, there are some other applications where, you know, Essentially, we use some kind of waves to, to understand the, the deep interior of the, of the, of the, of the material. So uh, we have seen, uh, we have seen uh, continuous progress uh, over, over the years. 
uh, with the increase in compute power, you can see all of these different methods, which were used earlier in 1990. They're still being used, but, but they are pretty routine. So we have FWI, broadband processing, GPU cluster, and all of these. So just because computers have become faster, we're able to use more complete physics. Are we, are we done? Not quite. We still have to do more uh, elastic FWI for quantitative seismic interpretation. I think this has just begun and we will see a lot more of that. And isotropic FWI, and this is, there's a great focus on that. Uh, uncertainty quantification, our group has been working on that quite a bit. Cycle skipping problem is still existing and uh, different groups are making progress and to, into addressing those using different tools. And in our group, we have a new technique, which is currently been submitted for a patent application. And one thing that is quite encouraging is looking into some of the new ideas that, that have been uh, proposed in deep learning. Uh, there, is, uh, there are a few things that can, be, uh, that can be applied directly or some that can be, that can be applied with some, some improvement in some of the techniques proposed in deep learning. And uh, that would really uh, make a lot of these calculations a uh, lot more faster. But when I was a grad student, I never thought we could actually uh, simulate a 3D seismic uh, model, but we are doing FWI now in 3D, even though mostly an acoustic case. I think uh, it won't be long before you start to see elastic and astropic and so on and so forth. So with these words, I'd like to stop and uh, maybe open up the floor for some discussion.